Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Leslie Lair in support of A Boob's Life this evening and joined in conversation by novelist Caroline Levitt. First, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat uh, window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase A Boob's Life from Literati. There's also a link to purchase books in the description right below if you're watching later on YouTube. And if you're watching live, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of our event this evening at any time using the Q&A feature available to you in the webinar. It's probably at the bottom of your screen on your toolbar at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com slash event. Uh, or just at literatibookstore.com, excuse me, for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you can consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming, whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Leslie Lair is a prize-winning author, screenwriter, essayist, and story consultant. She's the author of 66 Laps, Wife Goes On, and What a Mother Knows. And her essays have been published in the New York Times Modern Love column in Huffington Post. He's a member of Penn, the Authors Guild, WGA, Women in Film, and the Women's Leadership Council. She lives in Southern California. Her latest book, A Boob's Life, has been named a must-read for March by Good Morning America and Glamour Magazine, and is a People Magazine Best New Book. And Caroline Levitt is the award-winning author of 12 novels, including the New York Times bestseller, Pictures of You, and Is This Tomorrow? Her essays and stories have been included in New York Magazine, Psychology Today, More, Parenting, Red Book, and Salon. She's a book critic for People, the Boston Globe, and the San Francisco Chronicle, and she teaches writing online at Stanford and UCLA. Uh, they can't hear you, uh, but they can sense it through the power of the internet, so please join me in a round of raucous applause and welcoming <laughs> Leslie Lair and Caroline Levitt into your living rooms. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here interviewing Leslie. I don't remember when we met Leslie, only it feels like we've known each other since we were kids, even though that's not quite true. Um, I absolutely love this book, A Boob's Life, and I want to just start up by reading some praise of it for everybody. As women, we are always asking ourselves, are we enough? Leslie Lear's witty, wise, and sometimes heartbreaking memoir, A Boob's Life, uses our relationship with breasts and the ways others define us through them to explore what it means to live in a woman's body. Original, thought-provoking, and with an elegant sense of humor, A Boob's Life is a must-read. Selma Hayek. I also supplied a blurb for Leslie's book because I loved it so much. And this is what I said. Deeply personal, wisely funny and moving. This isn't just a fantastic intimate memoir about how cancer, survival and life in general changed Leslie's entire relationship with her body parts, but an exploration of how our breast obsessed culture, women's lib and men have shaped our feelings about our breasts. Insightful, delightful and eye opening. And one more from People Magazine who put this under best new book books. Lair combines stories from her own life with cultural analysis to illuminate our society's fixation on the feminine form, breasts in particular, and how that focus shapes us all. So Leslie is going to be reading from her book, but first I'm going to ask her a question. Okay, so Leslie, I have to ask, why breasts? Why more than any other body part does this define us? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Caroline, for being here. It's such an honor. I, I yeah, I really appreciate your support. And um, all those reviews are just thrilling. And gosh, well, why wouldn't it be boobs? Uh, it's, as you say, breasts, but I feel more comfortable calling them boobs. That's why I title it that way. Um, because it's the first thing anyone sees when you walk in the room that identifies you as a woman. And um, 
also because of how I discovered that every stage of a woman's life can be defined by her breasts and certainly mine was. And because it's an organ that has no medical specialty. I mean, just the definition of the process that it makes blood into milk makes it this life defining organ that not only nurtures life, but it also can kill us. And it's just every single day, women have to decide, are we gonna show them? Are we gonna hide them? Are we gonna wear a bra? Did COVID kill the bra? I mean, it's, you know, it is part of our lives that we just take for granted. And, and I just could not find one book that covered a whole lifetime or, or made me, help me understand why I had this obsession. And it just, you know, I saw books about breast cancer, breastfeeding, um, and it was, there was nothing that connected the dots. So boobs was just, it, it wasn't like I wanted to pick a body part. Boobs mm -hmm. picked me. It was, I had to know a detective <laughs> story. What was going on? Why was I feeling this way about my boobs? Well, the book is absolutely great, and it's really written in this very unusual way because it is partly a memoir where we hear about you as a little girl, your relationship with your father, and then, of course, growing up in prom and hilarious things that I think most women can identify with, you know, stuff in our bras and training bras, which is hilarious. I was a 32 AAA, um, but the way it's written is amazing because it's not just memoir. It's also, you have lists of certain things, like lists of the first bras, lists of the Miss America contest, which is very sexualized contest. Um, and also, there's also like different thematic structures running through the way we're supposed to be wives, mothers, working women, but not too successful working women. Um, so I wanted to ask two questions about that and then I'm gonna have you read. The first question is, how did you come about with the structure for the book? Because it's so unusual and yet it's so perfect. Wow, thank you. Well, there really wasn't another choice for me because when I, you'll see from the pages I read, um, the first night I decided to write the book, um, I had all these boxes of scrap because I was trying to decide, well, why am I obsessed? I was really upset. My husband accused me of being obsessed. And I thought, it's not just me. And I was unpacking, I just moved and I was looking through my scrapbooks and I could see every stage of my life. I could define by my breasts. And looking at the old time scrapbooks where I would cut out newspaper articles and magazine clips and listen to song lyrics and write them down, everything I realized that shaped how I felt about my breasts. The only way that I could figure out the answer to this question originally, what it was, am I going to fix my breasts? What was wrong with them? Why did I feel this way? Was to see how I had gotten this way. And by t I had to look at my story, personal story, through the lens of the entire nation. And the only way to do it was to also have all this research. And the list came about just because I found out so many fun facts that didn't fit in the story. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> how am I gonna put that? And there's already, I mean, there's 16 pages of color pictures, but there's also seven pages of footnotes. And it would have been a lot more, but I was like, no, no, no. I'm just gonna put a lot of this stuff you know, in between the chapters so that you can read my version of it and what directly affected me, but with these lists of who was in Playboy and when those years were and, and who right. died of breast cancer and, you know, and funny boob jokes, things that weren't directly related to my life, but were in the culture that I was growing up in and, and going through life in. Well, that's what I loved about the book, because it's not just a cultural history. It's also deeply, deeply personal. And I think that's what makes it universal. So we're going to have Leslie read twice because the book is so fascinating. So Leslie, set it up and do your first reading and they'll have more questions for you. Well, they're both very short readings. Um, this is the opening of the book. And um, it's chapter one, it's set in 2015. That's when I started the book. That's how long this has been a labor of love. And this is actually all true in how I decided to write the book this night. The chapter is <laughs> called Obsession. And it begins, my nipples are cross-eyed. I see it clearly in the bathroom mirror the moment I step out of the shower. As steam clouds the view, I wave my towel and pray it was an optical illusion. No, they're definitely pointing in different directions as if embarrassed to meet my eyes, or maybe this is payback. The truth is my breasts have been loathed and loved, suckled and stuffed, radiated and reconstructed. They have doomed one marriage and inspired another. 
Yet every step of the way, they've had the finest treatment in America. By now, they should be perfect. Hun, my husband John, calls from the bedroom. What's taking so long? Since we married a few years ago, both of his parents passed away, and then I got cancer. This is the first home we bought together, a condo with an ocean view we'll enjoy for a few years as a reward for all we've been through. The 99-step climb is like a stairway to heaven, but I didn't have to die to get here. This is our first night to relax and renew our romance. I try. First, I dab perfume behind my ears and unclip my damp chemo curls. Then I take a deep breath and look again. If I raise up my right shoulder and arch my back just so, my breasts are lush and round and almost even. But there's no ignoring the truth. I pull a cotton nightgown over my head as fast as I can. Then I shove my towel so hard into the plastic hamper that the piece of crap falls over. My husband tears his eyes from the TV as I stomp into the bedroom. You okay? I snatch my phone from the cardboard moving box by the bed. I have to call my doctor. Now, he asks over the swell of applause for the late show, are you in pain? Yes, I wanna say, psychic pain. Then I realize the doctor's answering service won't consider that an emergency. When I shake my head, my husband smiles and pats the bed beside him. I surrender the phone and scooch over. He rubs my leg and glances back at the TV where the host is mid monologue. I start to relax. Then the host tells a boob joke about JLo. The TV audience roars. I turn to my husband who to his credit is not laughing. This guy gets paid millions of dollars and that's the best he can do. She's the producer of a successful TV show. He shrugs. Comedians have always made boob jokes. Exactly, I say, it's not original. Why are they laughing? There's a neon sign that flashes the word laugh. No, they're really laughing, he says. I bet half the people in the audience are women and they're laughing too. Boob jokes are funny. But why, I ask, every woman in the world has boobs. That's why they're the first female body part a man sees when a woman walks into the room. The laughter dies down on the television. The comedian is talking, but I don't care. I hate him. What makes a boob funny? Boobs just sit there all round and funny looking. Dicks just sit there too, I say, and they're far more funny looking. Why aren't there more dick jokes? Dick jokes are insulting. All jokes are insulting. They make fun of something. Isn't that how humor works? Isn't it how the word sounds? I mean, no one says breast jokes. Breasts are beautiful, everyone knows that. When you call them boobs, it's funny. But boob means stupid. How can an organ that turns blood into milk for babies be stupid? Lighten up, hon, he says. He winces as if I've been shouting. I just don't understand why people always laugh at boob jokes. They're not funny. Why are you being so sensitive? I don't answer on the grounds that it might incriminate me. I remove his hand from my thigh. He raises his eyebrows. I take a deep breath and try to let it go, but I feel like punching somebody and he's the only one here. So much for romance. <laughs> I love that. You know, as you were reading that, I had a thought, which is, you know, I was thinking about that because there are like so many boob jokes. And I was wondering, do you think that it's a way of diminishing women's power? You know, like putting us in our place almost by these boob jokes? Well, I think that's absolutely the result of it. I mean, by objectifying a part of our body so much right. that we do it ourselves. I mean, I don't know that that was the purpose originally of the first, I don't know what the first boob joke was, but certainly a man <laughs> made fun of somebody, something because he right. knew he could get away with it. You know, I don't know. Okay. I want to talk about, there's a lot about marriage in this book. Your first marriage, which is you know, really almost painful to read about. And it's interesting that your first not so great marriage was a lot defined by your body and your breasts. And so in a completely different way, in a very healthy way, is your marriage to the great story structure guru, John Truby. Can you talk about the differences between your two marriages and the differences in your body image? 
Well, it's kind of ironic because they're flipped of how you would think yeah. about it. And I hadn't really thought about it that way. When I met my first husband, I was an executive at a production company and I had very short hair, big glasses, and I was doing everything I could to not be sexual. And I was just being the smart, you know, young person on staff in charge of way too much for my age and not getting the pay for it. Um, and he like, just looked at me, he was handsome and looked at me as this woman. And it was like, I made me feel special because I wasn't in that role. I mean, I had a comforter that was black and white plaid. I remember my mom saying, that's not feminine. But um, <laughs> you know, so I really went into that marriage thinking I'm capable. And then he saw me as this woman and wanted me to have children with him. And it kind of flattered me. But then as soon as that happened, that my body really was my identity, I had no more power at all. And so my body really trapped me in a position without childcare to stay home. We both by then were freelance in the film business. And it was very tricky that my body really held me back physically. Um, and then with my new marriage, it was completely the opposite. I was finally feeling really womanly and sexually and felt like I got this guy who I had actually met actually when I was engaged to my first husband. Um, <laughs> you have to tell that story. Because that's, that's another story. Wonderful. Well, that's my modern that's my modern love article. I was going to ask about the modern love app, which, yeah. okay, let's tell okay, this. Anyway, so I, I, I really felt like I, try, I got him because I looked so sexy and everything. I, at least that's how I felt. Um, and yet I get to be as smart as I want and do everything with my brain. And he, re, he respected that part of it. And when I got sick and was bald and bloated and gross and had zero sexuality at all, um, you know, in treatment for cancer, he loved me just the same. And it was pretty shocking to me that, oh, maybe all that work I did, you know, all that try to be sexiness really wasn't what he was attracted to at all. I mean, I'm sure it was part of it, but he, it, you know, it was pretty amazing. It was surprising. So that's, that's the most work. moving, that's the most moving part of your modern love. Um, I yeah. urge everybody to go look it up. Leslie, there's modern yeah. love. It's this wonderful, amazing story where she, she just sort of thinks like, now I'm not attractive anymore. And that's what he wanted yeah. because of the cancer therapy. And you have him say this wonderful thing as you slip into bed. He says, this is a really good date. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> wow, that is really, that is really deep, multi-layered love. And it changed you. I mean, the essay yeah. is just incredible. Well, I also, Carolyn, you, I don't know if you remember this, but I think you were the one who suggested I, I write an essay for Modern Love. Oh, I did? Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I'm glad I did. I it's a great it and thought, oh. Yeah, and it got I got really lucky. So yeah, thank that you. That is really great. Okay, so you also captured motherhood really superbly. And what I really loved is how incredibly honest you were talking about it because there's, you know, motherhood is touted as something that's going to be empowering and there's a lot of pressure on women to breastfeed. Um, and nobody ever mentions that it hurts and that it's really, really freaking hard to do. Um, and there are so many women also who pressure you to do this. So breasts are for all are biologically there to attract men, but they're also there to feed our children. Um, I wanted to know like what you feel about, um, you know, what women are told about how the right way to have a child, have a baby and the right way to breast feed versus the way that feels best for you and your body. Could you say something about that, please? Oh, of course. Well, I think for me, actually, my first book was called Welcome to Mom, The End of Life as You Know It, because it was such a <laughs> shocking thing. But the publisher, it was just a bunch of essays about how upset I was and shocked to be home. It is like, shocking. <laughs> yeah. And they made me change the subtitle to The Adventure Begins. And um, and it did. But I, I think for me, I mean, until last year about 18 months ago was the first time that all states made breastfeeding legal and yet even today and i updated all my statistics in december um for only 40 percent of people think that it should be able to be done in public so i think really? that, yeah so and i think that breastfeeding is one of those things where that old dude named freud created this madonna whore thing where we're either these wonderful mothers right. or we're horrible and heathen and i think right. the intersection of that is kind of at the nipple you know you can't show i mean you it's legal to breastfeed in public but if you show the nipple you'll get arrested for that's public. ridiculous it's just how how because of things are messed up but as far as breastfeeding i mean 
the fact is that doctors do say it's essentially customized immunity food right. that comes out of our breast. And there's more information in the Library of Congress about erectile dysfunction in tomatoes than there is about breast milk. And so it is an ideal kind of, of way to feed your children. And yet women in this country don't get the support we need to all be successful in doing right. it in terms of help and access to places to do it. And women who have to work and can't afford all the equipment or the space, right. the milk. So you'll find that other, you know, other groups of women are at a complete disadvantage even trying. And then many people who have physical or these other economical limits to it are also often shamed. And I remember yeah. there's a place called the pump station in LA that had a sign where motherhood begins. Like if you don't breastfeed, you're not a good mother. And for me, one of the themes of this book is I would like womanhood to be a no judgment zone. You know, yeah. we all do the best that we can. And, and here's a weird fun fact also that, um, you know, humans are the only mammals who have developed breasts all of our lives. I mean, puppies, oh, kittens, right. cows, that's right. breasts go away when you don't need them. So there's, there's, right. they're biological and yet some sort of, uh, you know, survival of who you mate with made us have them also for beauty. And so this double bind occurs. And so I am all for trying to breastfeed as much as you can. And if you can't, that's okay. You know, right. we all do our best. That's, we that's do our best. I think yeah. that should be women's motto. Uh, yeah, so I wanted, I wanted to talk about the mood shifts in the memoir, which is partly why I just loved it so much. And we were talking a little bit before we started this interview. And I mentioned that when I started the book, I was just laughing. And because there was so much that was so fun about being a young girl. And girls really want to have breasts. And if you don't, it's terrible. And the boys snapped our the back of our if, we had straps. One. Yeah. if you had one and usually you wanted one just so it could get snapped exactly yeah but then you know so i'm happily reading along saying oh this is so great this is so involving then i got to the chapter that absolutely decimated decimated me which was your brave and very powerful chapter about having breast cancer i was literally weeping because it was so moving and so true and you were so present. So what I want to ask is what did it feel like to write that? And, you know, especially after the initial, like very happy, hopeful section. And I mean, there's, there's another difficult pain, not difficult, but painful section in the book to read, which is about your first marriage. How did you feel revisiting all that? Did you, did you look at it differently now? Well, it wasn't fun. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I didn't want to write a cancer book and I did not keep a journal when I had cancer and I did not take any pictures of myself bald. I wanted to forget it happened and not be defined by it. Um, and yet when I wrote the book, uh, my agents really said, you cannot just gloss over this. People right. don't realize what it's really like. You got to say what it's really like. And so I did that and went pretty deep with it. And then I was able to then kind of get through it to a place and do more research in the second. There's of 19 chapters, there's only two about breast cancer. The second one though talks about treatment after and, and what I learned. And in fact, I always have mm -hmm. to have a Kleenex because one of the side effects that will probably be with me forever is because my nose is a little drippy because when I had chemo, scar tissue started closing up my tear ducts and every three weeks I had to go to a doctor. I've never said this out loud before. Um, and he had to poke like needles down my tear ducts to keep them open so they wouldn't scar open. And so now they're a little <laughs> extra open. So my nose is always a little bit drippy. So I look like a little old lady. That's one of the side effects that I'll have forever. But, but I mean, I'm grateful to be alive. And what I realized later is that a lot of the things that as women that our breasts represent caretaking for other people create this super sense of responsibility and stress that actually at Ohio State, um, not far from Michigan, they discovered something called the ATF3 gene, which is like, it's a chemical trigger that stress pushes to create a bigger vulnerability to breast cancer for women. So stress actually can kill us. So it's almost like, you know, and I, I really feel like part of the reason that I got cancer probably because I didn't have the gene was due to an accumulation of trauma and stress and just trying to do it all always because physically I felt like I was really healthy. And so by writing the second chapter, I really was able to identify, oh my gosh, if I can help people by 
spreading the responsibility and having us know that self-care is not a trend. This is really life or death. You know, maybe more people and more people. And also a mammogram saved my life. One drug that people I know didn't get because it was new. I mean, I would be dead twice. You know, had I not gotten that mammogram by the next one, my had was fast, fast growing, I wouldn't be here. And that drug also I was lucky to get. And I know people who didn't make it. So it's just, you know, it turns out that um, prevention is really important if you can do it. And yeah, so and you had some statistic yeah. in the book that was terrifying about the number of women who get breast cancer every year. 300,000 and, and 42,000 die. Oh my God. Every, even this year, you know, it's, uh, it is another kind of plague and it's only recently that um, it's become, it used to be the women's disease. Even there's movies, you know, back in the eighties and nineties where you realize later, oh, they had breast cancer, but you don't say it. You know, it wasn't until President Clinton's uh, mother died of it, like I think in four years later in 98, when there was insurance that helped reconstruction. And that's another thing is reconstruction is such a big deal. I mean, I know women who've spent two years of surgeries to get their breasts back. That's how much breasts are part of a woman's identity. And of course, some people don't, don't, you know, but it's really, it's just a big, it's a big deal. And because it attacks our very being, our breasts are, you know, part of who we are as women. So... Yeah, that's right. That's right. I can remember. I don't remember what movie it was. It was actually a prison drama where some guy on the on the show had breast cancer and he was absolutely he was beaten up and mocked because it was a women's disease. Right, right. And the thing is, I know a lot of women who will not go and get mammograms because they're afraid. And I it's like what you said. I feel like, no, 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 no. You have to be afraid or you can die. Yeah, yeah. You, but, have, uh, but you also, have to do that. But self, uh, self exams are also, most of the people who have good treatment and good outcomes f- find them themselves actually. I, I wasn't one of those. But, but to answer your original question, no, it was not a fun chapter to write. Um, I did find a lot of silver linings because I was able to really talk about different things that happened with various doctors and some very funny things as well. Um, and I really, you know, was like, take off my boobs. I don't care. But they were like, no, that won't make a difference with you. It could come back. So I was, I was very upset about my hair. My hair is finally back. That's hard. That's hard yeah. on you. I, I had an illness where I lost my hair and yeah. that was really hard because yeah. it's so much of your identity and yeah. It's true. But then when I did have, when I was done with it and I knew my hair was coming back, um, then it was all about my boobs. And that's why the book was like, why am I still so upset? I had had all these surgeries and then I had to redo, I, you know, implants. And then one rolled up from radiation. I was like, cost a boob. And then, then it was like, still, they weren't quite right. And I was, why? I was so (laughs) upset. Why was I upset? Well, yeah, it's trauma on top of trauma yeah, for so that, you. And that Absolutely. was the book, really. It's like, why am I so upset? I should be grateful to be alive. And I am, but I still want my boobs to be nice. Well, but, you're a human being and you're a woman. And we, of course you would feel that way. Yeah, and we're women. Right. We want to be pretty. It's part of it's part of being a woman. I think it's part of being human. Yes. Um, I Before I have you read again, I have to ask you the big question. One of the most thing about this book is that your memoirs in development with Selma Hayek oh. as a TV series for yeah. HBO Max. So as I was reading your book, I was wondering, do you have any idea how they're, what they're thinking about in terms of story? Is Selma going to oh, star yeah. in I'm it? I'm an executive producer. So oh, you are. Oh, that's great. That's even yeah. better. That's even better. How is it? Because this is a, this is like one of those books that if you're looking at it, most people would say, well, that's, it's not going to translate to the screen, yeah. but how is it going to translate to the screen? That's so it's, great. It's a comedy series. Oh, a comedy series. Yeah. And I think originally they were thinking kind of in the vein of free bag, but essentially the main character's name is Leslie and my boobs are going to talk. You get your name, that your boobs are going to talk? Yeah. Wait, what are they going to say? Like, tell me Probably, like, what episode episode to be like. This, why, do you, why are you covering me up? Why are you so mean? I don't know. I think they're going to be kind of my alter ego voice of, of you know, reason when I'm my character. I love it. That's yeah. genius. That is genius. How did this come about? Did, did Selma Hayek just approach you or? No, I, I, a friend who I only knew by her first name, I was always... She was like, I was helping her with some writing and she was like, well, what are you working on? And I was, oh, I'm working on this thing about boobs. And she wanted to read it. And she said, you know, I just like shop this around and I, nothing was happening to it. I hadn't sold the book yet. And I just said, sure, 
you know, signed a contract with her. And this is so turned great. Out she made some really good friends. <laughs> so, and she uh, got it to Selma Hayek. Selma immediately said she was obsessed. And Selma Hayek is, I mean, she has boob power, right? She's she and Dolly Parton. They use her boobs for good. She's produced Frida and Ugly Betty and um, Monarca, which is this long-running Spanish language series, series. She has a production company that has stuff all over town. She's really busy, really smart. And she told me on the phone that she was obsessed with this book and she has a first deal, first book deal with HBO Max. And she was one of the first projects she brought there. So right now we're just in the pilot stage. There's a lot of steps to go for even to get picked up as series. And then it takes a long time and then there's COVID, but um, I'm excited. So but we'll it's see a wonderful happens. thing. Yeah. It's a totally wonderful thing. Are, have you chosen to do any of the writing for this or? No, in it... fact, well, I originally wanted totally to do the writing and they said they needed an approved TV showrunner to do it. And I, right. I, yeah, and I could do it down the road, but they didn't want me in meetings, especially since it's about me, because it's not going to be true to the book. Exactly. Right, right. That makes sense. The they didn't want me to be arguing things. And, and I like get it. The book is my baby. You know, it'll be out for a long time before the TV thing happens, and I need to be separated. Plus, I'm working on another book now. So, oh, what's your other book? Can you say anything about it? It's a novel. <laughs> I'm going back to it's based on a true <laughs> story, also. but enough, enough <laughs> reality. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Would you read some more for us? Sure. Hang on a sec. Also, anybody out there, please submit questions at any time. No quit. Every question is. A wonderful question. Don't be shy. Your face will not be up here. And we don't even have to use your name if you don't want us to. Okay. This is just less than a page. And uh, it's from chapter seven. And chap there are three sections in the book. This is called part two, the booby trap, adulthood. And the chapter is called from Ms. to mom, 1983. I know I'm really old, but anyway, being an adult <laughs> went beyond discovering who I was. It meant deciding, but it soon became clear that this wasn't up to me. My identity had far too much to do with my breasts. To be a career woman, I had to hide them. To be a mother, I had to use them. I tried my best to do both. After film school, I worked freelance as a production assistant and scored two weeks of work on the Doobie Brothers Farewell, a concert video for Showtime. The job paid $200 for a six day week, but it was on the legendary Paramount lot. During an epic heat wave, I started at dawn running purchase orders from our second floor sweat box clear to the executive building. I played along with the flirting. That's what we called sexual harassment back then and ran back to type memos until midnight. I was living the dream. When the producer invited me to the shoot, I packed my best sundress, a butter yellow halter and flew to Berkeley. I ironed my dress on the hotel bed and burnt the bedspread forfeiting my paycheck. It was worth it. I was working with one of my favorite bands on a real TV show. The prep meeting was in a cavernous room backstage at the Greek theater. Introductions were made from the band and roadies to the film crew and finally me, the only one in a dress without a bra. I felt slightly self-conscious until one of the musicians smiled and said they'd been looking forward to meeting me. He pointed to a memo pinned to the Bolton board when I went to admire my handiwork after the meeting, I saw why. I had typed to the Booby Brothers. I never went to work without a blazer again. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So I want to ask you, if you had to just narrow it down to one thing, what do you want people to take away from this book? I don't know that I could narrow it down to one thing. I, okay, I really, so give us a couple. Give us a couple. I want us, I, I mean, biology, we can't fight biology. Our breasts are part of our beauty. But I right. think that if we're aware of how we are treated because of we have breasts and how we judge ourselves and, and require so much of ourselves because of our breasts, I think that our awareness can help change the culture a little bit. And I also think that, like I said, I would love us to stop judging each other and ourselves by how we look, particularly our boobs. And um, self-care is really critical. And I also think that the biggest message, I think the whole book kind of funnels to the end of how I really am a believer in inclusiveness. I think we all need to treat ourselves and each other exactly the same and fairly. And um, I think that when we know better, we do better. 
So I agree. You know, I want to I want to ask another question in terms of women writers. Um, I'm very happy that the term chiclet seems to have been demolished yeah. because yeah. there's no men's lit. It, there's no there's and the whole term women writers sort of rubs me the wrong way because I often feel like it's subjugating women that it should just be literature. So I wanted to know, like, what do you think about that? Like, do you think that it's getting better from where you are, from where you're standing and seeing what stuff is going on? Um, do you see it getting better in the future? Or do you think it's just something that's going to take a while? I, I think with all, the whole women's thing, I think right now it seems like everything's fixed and I don't think it is. Um, and I really, really regret not using my initials early in my career, except that's for, yeah, except for I always write about women. And so maybe that's going to relegate me down. Men can write about women and women just right. That's right. And write about men. But I also think with um, that men, I mean, history, we read all the time and it's always men's history, men writing about history. Mm -hmm. I think that's why memoir is a really important thing is it's really women's history and I think right. women's fiction, I don't like going in bookstores, even my last novel, um, I, I don't like seeing it in women's fiction. It should just be in fiction, you know? Right. Yes. <laughs> so yes. yeah, I, I, I'm unhappy about it because no man is going to go look at women's fiction, you know? And the thing yes. is that women do, I think, read more fiction than men, even stuff read by men, because, you know, a lot of men don't like to deal with the emotional stuff and they'll deal a lot with read not nonfiction. And so I think there's, it's, it's, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just think the more we're aware of it again, maybe they'll stop having those sections of women's fiction. And, I hope and so. Fiction. I hope yeah. so. How do you feel about it? I, I don't like it at all. I think it should just be fiction. Yeah. We're, there's you more know? women than men in the country. Why should it's, we be in a smaller place of our books? Uh oh, like if you, by woman that's that's very strange that's absolutely very very strange yeah. so okay the question i always want to ask what's obsessing you now leslie and why wow what's obsessing me now that's a tough questions i guess i'm afraid of history repeating itself i don't want um i i, I think with the pandemic my my obsession is child care we need child care we yes. need equal pay. If we had equal pay, women do, we wouldn't be so dependent on the men who pay, who have to work so much to do everything. And, but both of us, we all need childcare to make everyone have the opportunities. So I'm, I'm a little worried about how we're all doing um, right now, you know, with all this extra responsibility that's now in everyone's face. So that's, that's it's not a accession so much as a, a real concern that I have but I'm not obsessed with the body part anymore <laughs> I'm like oh still, really oh that's so yeah. interesting that's so interesting I feel okay. like I, I feel like okay now I get it it's not my fault okay right. I'm a creature of my environment I'm part of the problem and as long as I know that every day when I get dressed I'm aware of what I'm trying to project in the world it's not just my breasts and you know uh, <laughs> but it is my breasts because that's who I am so it's it's right. a tricky thing yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay, so another question I always like to ask authors is, what question didn't I ask that I should have asked? What did? What do you really want to talk about that I didn't bring up? I think you brought everything up. I really do. Oh. I think what, what you didn't bring up is, I would love people to know that I I like to visit book clubs. If anyone has a book club, please invite me. That was gonna be me. my next thing. I was yeah. gonna say that next. Because I love talking about boobs and I have so much <laughs> research that didn't make it into the book and so many stories that didn't make it in the book. It tells a nice story. And I think all of women, we all have stories. And yes. you know that's what's really hitting home about this book. Everyone can relate to some part of it. And men too, I think men are really thinking, oh, wow, I never realized this was a thing. And, right. and yeah, it's a thing. So I wanna hear everyone's stories. I want us to engage. I feel like that's how we can become aware and we can change the culture to make it us all happier in our bodies and in our lives and where we are. So. Um, I, I also wanna mention that Leslie is really active on social media. She's an absolutely delightful presence. Um, she loves her community on her Facebook page, which is author Leslie Lair page. So please follow her there. She's also Leslie Lair one on Instagram and Twitter and even LinkedIn. Um, John at Literati, do you have questions from the audience for Leslie? 
We do. We have, we have, we have some questions or we have a question um, and I'll remind viewers they can submit their questions using the Q and A feature. Um, now is the time to do so. First is just a comment. Um, Deborah Donahue writes that she doesn't have a question. She just wanted to say that she can't read, can't wait to read the book. Oh, great. Um, she met you one at once at Cardigan's Knit Shop in Santa Barbara and Caroline. Ah. I also love your work and it's been a delight to hear you both. Great. Um, there's a question here. Um, did you find it helpful to apply fiction techniques to writing a memoir? So in terms of craft, obviously memoirs are sometimes written in the kind of form of fiction. And I'm always curious too with, with memoir authors, how they, um, well, actually I will save that question. First, did you, did, do you find it helpful to apply, apply fiction techniques to writing a memoir? Absolutely. And I, I use the same st story structure, whether I'm writing an essay or a novel or nonfiction or a script. And um, for me, in this book, you'll see the second chapter, The Dive, is probably the most narrative chapter. It's a very descriptive little story about something scary that happened when I was young that brought boobs into focus for me. And um, because I didn't have any cultural awareness then, I didn't have to start adding in any cultural or analysis or interpretation. So it's pure fiction. It's very narrative. Almost every chapter is written with scenes. And so the trick for me in writing this book, I've never written a memoir before. I never will again, probably. Um, <laughs> this is, it was very tricky to go through my experience and then ease into a thought at that stage of how my experience compared to the world at large and kind of trying to a a analyze how I fit in, in America that way, and then move on seamlessly to the next story and also not have final conclusions, but have them along the way as my journey of learning about this really grew writing the story. I didn't really get, in fact, originally the book ended in 2018 at my mother's 80th birthday and I was just deciding if I was going to boost fix again. And then history kept happening and more things happened. My things happen in my own family, things happen to my daughters that had happened to me, uh, big things, little things, funny things. And so I had, I actually had to continue the book in a way that was even more powerful and end it in December. So it was, I definitely love starting with the fiction. That's my default. And then adding the, the other things. But that said, I also always start kind of with the essay and then build, build on it from there. But fiction techniques are, you just can't go wrong when you know craft. <laughs> so for a writer does that come in with like the thing i'm curious about is is like dialogue or or recollection i mean a lot of the research of a memoir is just one's mind and you know i've read a lot from a craft standpoint of how one wants to hew to towards not the exact truth because what is that when you're dealing with one's memory but like the the the, the felt truth but so much of writing for lots of writers that I've encountered comes from the revision process. I know lots of sort of, especially in fiction, a lot of the creativity comes through editing and revising and new discoveries are made. And I'm curious what that looks like. Um, I'm always curious to know what that looks like for memoir writers in revising that, um, especially in the essay as well. Um, yeah. I, I think what you're getting at is that I think when I was telling my stories, um, I mean, I started out by, thinking of every topic I could related to boobs and then looking at every stage of my life and seeing how they related and how all that fit in. But when I would write the narrative part, like the, the story of it, in the revision process, I had to go through and see how that really proved what I learned from that experience and how it compared to this culture, what, I, what it meant to me and to, a, about the world at large. And so the revision process was a lot about making sure I got the point. And that's where you go on, uh, memoir it has to be all real things and it was about editing out things that didn't add to the point and making sure to have enough touch space to bring up things that honed in on the point and and as you said like dialogue all that is real or from memory or reconstructed but being careful like in fiction not to go back about things I'm thinking about unless they really help move the story forward so it's a very forward moving situation in, in all forms and especially memoir. So that was, you can't just make stuff up. There's another, another question here. Um, how are your attitudes towards your breasts different than your mother's? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> you can call my mom. Um, <laughs> she's, I think 
I think I got my attitude a lot from her. My mother is a PhD, very smart woman, but also was very caught in that double bind. She was a, you know, a woman's liver and yet also beautiful and being curvy and posed as you'll see in the book, um, there's pictures of her. And uh, it's, it's tricky, but of course, one of the funniest scenes in the book is when she felt I was deformed because she had never seen someone who had breastfed and I was like empty little sacks, you know? And she thought, how are you gonna attract a man? And how do you feel womanly like that? And I was like <laughs> wearing my flat chest like a shield. I'm a mother and I use my breasts. So she definitely felt like she didn't want me to feel less womanly and, and or have the, any insecurity because she saw breasts as a part of beauty. And it, was, it wasn't just her though, it's the culture, that's what people think. So right now I think um, she's probably evolved like all of us in terms of how she feels. And yet she still you know, gives my kids a little bit of money every month to have beauty for to get their hair done and to, you know, because women, we like to feel good about themselves. And right. she's the first to make sure everyone has a good bra. And I'm now the same thing. I'm like, to my kids, anyone need a new bra? You know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a, I think all families, we kind of carry this thing that we learn and we're part of this, this beauty thing. You, you mentioned earlier in response to another question. Um, and forgive me if I'm, if, if I'm for asking if, if, you don't want to go there, but you said you probably will never write another memoir again. Um, so I'm just curious, like, is it, you know, the, obviously it's, it's, there's a lot of personal excavation that goes on, especially for a memoir like this. Um, and I mean, certainly you won't abandon the essay form. I hope not, no. but like. Personal but, essays for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, there might still be a collection of essays coming, oh, but no, no more memoirs. Okay. But I feel like all of our lives are a house right? And we have a lot of different rooms of the house. And this is my boob room. You know, <laughs> I, I looked at the, my whole life in terms of my boob. And as it turns out, it affected a lot of other rooms. But there's other rooms in my house. And I felt like writing a memoir is very tricky also for your family. And I, you know, everyone has so many family members who are very vulnerable. And I felt like I went just as deep as I needed to go to prove this point. And this is probably for me, I kind of feel like this is maybe why I survived breast cancer because I, I'm working with Stand Up to Cancer now. I'm trying to have messages of self-care. I'm hoping to help this message for women and men to judge each other fairly and be aware of all this stuff. And I feel like maybe this book was kind of the point of why I lived. I know that sounds really weird, but we're all going to die. So why, don't, why not write something that means something that has value? And the next book that I write, I has some really important themes too. And yet in fiction, it's more fun for me because I can play with stuff and right. I can really get into people's heads that I'm not in. So that's right. just, you know, a, just a more fun experience. So I'll probably that's why. Not because I hate memoir. I just don't know if I have anything as important to say as this to do in a memoir form. Uh, there's, there's another question here um, from a viewer who writes, do you think living in Los Angeles where physical appearance is very important has influenced how you think you should look? Absolutely. Except for, I mean, I always think, wow, my kids, my, my daughters, I think it's tough to have daughters grow up in the this epicenter of beauty and Hollywood that influences the whole world. That said, I grew up in Ohio and that's where I got obsessed by boobs because it was cheerleaders and Miss Ohio and the Miss America contest. And, you know, it's like, it's the homegrown college football. Um, we all want to be the corn fed girl next door who's beautiful. And that's actually how Playboy, you know, his, he didn't have sexy, sultry Hollywood vixens. It was all women in white and looking like little girls and pigtails and, and you know, so I feel like I grew up in a culture that is all Americana, but I do feel like there's more pressure in, in LA to keep looking a certain way. And I know that it's probably been far more challenging for my daughters and for other children who live here. Dovetailing with that, there's a question uh, asking if you could talk about the effect of Playboy on attitudes towards breasts, both for men and women. Well, I know Carolyn remarked on this uh, outside the conversation, but um, Playboy, first of all, Playboy was <laughs> invented by this dude, you know, Hefner, who was grew up in a very puritanical family. His parents were not affectionate. They didn't have a lot of uh, open love. He got engaged to him. And I think they were both virgins. I may be wrong about that. But I do know that she uh, had an affair while they were engaged. 
he went ahead and married her, but then he created Playboy. And I feel like he was taking revenge on the rest of women forever because <laughs> at that same time, and here's the answer to your question, Carolyn. One thing we didn't mention is the reason why I use my life as an example is because when I was born was this perfect storm of events, Playboy and advertising and television that was suddenly in everyone's homes, supported by advertising and men are attracted to a woman's breast. They will look at a woman's chest within 200 milliseconds of her entering a room. So if you want eyeballs for advertising to support TV, they started putting women who had big breasts on TV and Playboy totally took advantage. You know, they were a big thing and you'll see I have charts of play it would no one would go topless and then suddenly more people had to go topless and then they had to be in playboy and then celebrities had to go topless in playboy and in movies and in the 80s the uh, american society of plastic surgeons convinced the fda that small breasts were a disease and that's when plastic surgery opened up as a business uh, implants are still you know you talked about 300,000 women get breast cancer every year about the same number of women get breast implants every year. It's the most popular elective surgery for women, bar none. And it's, it's, Playboy has been a huge influence. And now of course you can see it everywhere online and then mm -hmm. Victoria's Secret. So yeah, I think Playboy was a huge deal. It was in my father's college library, just, I mean, it was part of what boys were allowed to look at. It's like, let's be a guy, we get to look at breasts. So yeah, I think it's been a huge influence on women and how we consider um, beauty in America. Well, we have reached the top of the hour. Uh, <laughs> Leslie Lair, Carolyn Levitt, thank you so much for joining us this evening on At Home with Literati. Uh, Leslie, congrats on all the success. Thank you so book. much. Um, I hope we can have you both back in uh, the store in Ann Arbor at some point in the not too distant future. Carolyn has a novel coming out soon uh, that I know will feature our humble little bookstore that we're very excited about. <laughs> yes, um, the characters so. go there. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, Maybe I but could host you. That would be wonderful. I was about yeah. to say, we could do this again in person. Yeah. Um, and I just but... want to say, love your boobs. <laughs> I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so um, much, Sean. Thank you. Thank, you. Been a thank great. you for joining us and, and hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, um, thank you for joining us as well. We hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And we will see you at the next event. So take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.